My name is Andre Pshivara. I'm with Zahn in the sunny city of Cambridge. And I work there in the kernel team, mostly on KVM stuff. And I'm here today to give you an idea of what um, interrupt virtualization, how it works, and what's it about. Um, so um, what we're going to do today is um, I give you a quick overview of what the, the current prevalent interrupt controller that you have in, in current ARM chips, the Geek V2 is, and what it does for virtualization, and what it, does it mean for KVM, so we, what, we, what challenges basically we faced in implementing it, um, and then give you an update on what Geek V3 adds to the game, and how, how that resulted in changes in the, uh, in the KVM code. And concluding with some kind of overview where we came from, where we currently are and what we are going to do. Um, so that's from 30,000 feet what a gig V2 looks like. Um, so you have, like here, this green thing is the distributor. Um, as you can see, it has, on the top, it has many, many interrupt lines, which are the input. Um, the architecture supports 988 of those, so plus 32, plus 4 equals then 10 bits. Um, those connect to each device um, which wants to send an interrupt to the system. Um, that sounds quite a lot, 88 wires, but remember this is an ARM SOC, so it's all on one die, so the wire's actually cheap there because it's on die, routing, middle layers, whatever. Um, on the left hand side, you see um, connections to each core, so that's a, it's an input to the distributor, namely the private interrupts that each core can generate. That's namely from the per core timer and also from the performance monitoring units which wants to send interrupts. They need to be accounted for. And eventually an interrupt has to be triggered to a CPU, so that also happens per CPU um, where the distributor asserts the interrupt line on the, on the core, so the core actually takes the interrupt. Enhances. Um, that's the interrupt side of it. On the bus side, which you see on the right and bottom of the, of the green box, um, there's a bus interface, so we, um, the um, control management registers of the distributor are memory mapped and can be accessed um, by, by software. Um, there's something special about it, so um, as you see, first there's the distributor, which has registers, and then there's um, down there CPU interfaces. So there's one CPU interface per core that you actually implement. Um, the interesting thing is that those CPU interfaces are all mapped at the same memory mapped um, address, but they are banked per, per core. That's um, that you can do because the AXI bus transports the information from which core the request came, and so. Um, the logic, the decoding logic can then um, separate out the, the access. That is also true for a certain set of registers inside the distributor, namely those registers that care about per core. So that each core basically kind of automatically only accesses its own registers if you do per core interrupt management. Which also means that you cannot do it from one core for another core. Each core has to do it for itself. Um, yeah, okay, that's just what I said basically, if you want to read it again later. Um, so what does kind of virtualization support have? So if you, if you um, look at the uh, spec, it says um, it has virtualization support, what we are talking about here. So um, if I said CPU interface before, it actually breaks down into three blocks inside the CPU interface. The first one is the and on the very right, the gig C, that's the normal CPU interface that you would expect where the software talks to, and it tells software about the state of the interrupts. 
and um, that talks directly to the distributor. So every time you trigger an interrupt or the interrupt line is asserted um, above, um, the gig C actually responds to those. Um, then there is a gig V interface, which is a virtual CPU interface, which uh, the registers, so the register um, semantics and the layout are exactly the same as the gig C, only that they don't talk to the distributor directly, but instead um, take the information from what we call list registers. So this, the list register is basically an idea to, to virtualize an interrupt. So if you want, as an hypervisor, inject an interrupt, you program a list register with the interrupt number and the state, pending, active, or both. Um, and then every time software ex actually accesses the CPU interface, it gets the information from the list register, not from the distributor. Um, and then there's the gig H, which is the hypervisor interface, which basically uh, allows you to program the list registers and does some other hypervisor related things. Um, yeah, so there's also an, another feature which allows you to, once you have set up a virtual interrupt, to connect it to a physical interrupt. Um, so if the guest then um, actually acknowledges um, or eventually EOIs uh, this interrupt, then at the same time the physical interrupt is EOI'd. Um, that's a feature that just lately got supported in software. And um, that is, for instance, useful if you have something um, like a time interrupt, which you take in the host and distributor, you set it up, um, you want the guest to play with it, and once the guest is done, you don't care about it anymore, and you also want to deal with the timer interrupt on the, um, on the host. So you can link this. Okay, how this is actually implemented, or how do we make use of this in KVM? Um, you see that on the on the picture on the right hand side, um, that the gig C and the gig H is something that we don't map to the guest at all. So the guest does not see this from the, but instead we map, we directly map through the gig V interface. So the, the physical address um, is mapped into the guest. So whenever the guest accesses, it goes through directly to the hardware part, but only to the gig V, which looks exactly like the gig C. And that is what we tell the guest, this is your gig C and the guest thinks that it is, um, only that doesn't talk to the distributor, but would talk to the hardware part, which we don't want the guest to do, but instead to the list register where we have our virtual interrupts. Um, the distributor itself um, is totally emulated because it's totally separate from the host. It, uh, is, there's a total different set of devices and you don't want the guest to talk to deal with uh, host interrupts. So that's why it's totally emulated in every access so we trap this um, and handle it in a kernel, in, in kernel emulation code. So we use the um, KVM in kernel IRQ controller machinery. So in kernel APIC is set on x86 that we have. And we use something along those lines to um, have most of the code in the, in the kernel so that we don't need to access to the um, to user land to deal with interrupts. Um, Yeah, so um, the life cycle goes like this. So whenever there's a virtual IRQ which is to be asserted, which usually comes from QEMU, um, it sets the, the interrupt line, then um, yeah, we create, the, um, we create appropriate list register entry. So we say this is the interrupt number 35 that it just got asserted, and the state is pending. And then we go into the guest, and the guest sees, oh, there's an interrupt accesses the uh, CPU interface, or what it thinks of the, the CPU interface, it gets redirected to the virtual CPU interface. Um, it sees, oh, that's uh, interrupt 35 and it's pending. So in the in, in moment it reads that it's 35, the um, hardware changes the state from pending to active. Um, yeah, then the guest uh, deals with the interrupt and once it's done, it says, I'm, I'm finished, it sends an EOI. So it says, I'm finished. And in this moment, the state goes from active to nothing basically. Um, and the good thing is that all those things happen without guest exit. So we, uh, because it's done by hardware, actually. So um, whenever we, we have to deal with 
the interrupt creation and injection still in a host, but the rest um, happens without host intervention. Yeah. So this whole code lives in uh, Word KVM ARM. The main reason to do it there was to share it between ARM and ARM64 because this hardware has stuff. So the gig is basically this, the very same between the two. Um, so there's no difference in the code. It's minor differences, of course, if you between the two architectures, but not so much. Uh, all right, so what um, challenges did we face during the implementation of the gig v2? Um, as I said, we have banked MMIO access, so some registers um, are separate depending on from which core you came from. Um, this is something that the KVMIO bus framework, which would be the natural thing to use for those, uh, does not, did not support, I'd say. I'd say at the time, so we had to invent our own stuff. So we first got a separate thing. And, um, because we needed the vCPU basically, so tiny little thing, but didn't support it. Um, also, as this is ARM, the whole mapping is very much platform specific. So every platform, there's no fixed value where the, uh, no, no fixed address where the gig is usually mapped at. So the um, user land, the QMO in this, um, thing needs to set up the address. So it, it creates the, the in-kernel IQ controller, and then it needs to set up the address, and it also needs to set up how many interrupts it support. Um, and only after the setup is done, um, it can be used. And it doesn't sound too complicated, but it has some funny effects, because um, on x86, you create an interrupt controller, and it's basically immediately usable. Um, and that's not the case, so there's some yeah, some, some time frame in between where we are in kind of strange state and we have to make sure that everything works out fine. Um, one, th one design decision that has been uh, made back then was um, that uh, um, code, design, code layout was designed around MMIO handling, so everything was streamlined to have neat and efficient handling of MMIO accesses to the distributor and we basically also modeled what the hardware does in terms of bitmaps and byte maps for everything, um, which is nice and the code looks, it looks cool and it's, it's very efficient. But the problem is that um, on interrupt injection or sync back, we have to iterate through all the bitmaps and byte maps and see what, so for instance, if we see if there's an interrupt pending, we have to go through the old interrupt pending bitmap and find out if there, which interrupt is it. And then we have the number and then we create a list register out of it. So it turns out that um, this whole MMIO handling is not so much performance sensitive as we thought because it's, it's happened rather rarely that you actually um, change the interrupt controller. Um, so it would be much smarter to actually um, model the whole idea, um, thing about um, interrupts that are actually pending or something. So we keep a list of interrupts, something like the list registers in, in software again. And then if you do MMIO handling, you can, you have, yeah, you could take the extra time to go through the list of registers and create the bitmaps out of the flyer. Um, yeah, um, also handling of level and edge triggered interrupts that proved to be very error prone and we had a lot of bugs in there and there's a lot of case distinction now. So if, if edge, then do this, if a level, then do this and this. Uh, kind of confusing to read, and uh, I have the gut feeling that there should be a better a, a way of handling this. Um, maybe not, but I hope so at least. And also the um, state, saving the state for migration proves to be annoying because uh, the state of the gig from a hardware side includes the distributor and the CPU interface, but we don't. So for a distributor, it's fine because we have all the emulation state and software but the CPU interface is virtualized. We use the virtualized part of the hardware. So in, if the guest, um, if user land wants to know the state of the gig, we have to kind of create the state of the um, CPU interface and make it up, basically. Um, yeah, that's the annoying part. Okay, if that is not all too complicated, then let's go on to gig v3. That's, um, that's a nice picture of a gig v3. In, in reality, it's much more complicated. It's really a beast. 
the spec is more than 700 pages. Um, um, so you see the distributor is still there, Ray. Um, it still has IQ lines and everything. What's, what got away is the, um, the, what was formed on the left-hand side, the connection to each core, because that got moved into a separate entity, separate register set, um, which is now called redistributor. Um, so every interrupt that is per core is now handled there, and the redistributors are all now mapped on separate addresses. So we have one, um, so it's not, it's not all the same, same address and it's not, no longer banked, so you can access each redistributor. The idea behind is that um, in a large scale system, which the GIG V3 is defined, um, actually defined for, um, you, um, yeah, you cannot go away with, you cannot get away with, with banking because it doesn't work across multiple chips, for instance, and so you have but if you have proper MMIO addresses with, uh, which are unique across the whole system, then this works out. Um, and, we are, and most of the times the redistributors are just mapped behind each other, so you still have one start offset, and then each redistributor takes two pages and goes to the next one. If you look at the KVM DTS, you see that the redistributor range is pretty large because for uh, each of the 48 cores, they have two pages, so it's quite a large region. Um, yeah, so that's the, the easy part of it. Um, the funny part is there's a new, a completely new block, which is called the ITS, Interrupted Translation Service, which basically deals with MSIs. Um, and it does it in a very, very fancy way. So it supports um, 4 billion MSIs, basically, interrupts. Um, and it can do it to 256 million cores, so that's really, and to support these kind of um, big things, they introduced basically kind of the usual thing, level of interaction, so basically like page tables for interrupts, so it's, uh, you have all kind of tables which map from something like called collection to CPUs, and then you map from devices to interrupts, and then you map from interrupts to um, the collection and everything, and um, as it wouldn't be enough, all this stuff is done in memory, in physical memory, so uh, there are tables in memory. But also um, the memory format is private to the ITS, so as a software you're not supposed to deal with it directly with the memory, you just give, you reserve the memory and give the ITS uh, the memory, and there's a ring buffer command interface which you actually use, so you set up a, a command and write it into ring buffer, to set up those tables. And then the ITS goes into uh, memory to actually set it up, the, the data. The idea behind is that um, if you have a large scale out system, you don't want to have this, all this data that you want to uh, need to save um, in, in gig memory, you want to use uh, system memory for this. Yeah, also an important fact that the CPU interface that was there before has now moved directly into the core um, and it's no longer MMIO mapped, but instead it uses system register access, which is a natural thing to have a per core um, access, and it's also much more easier to implement for, from a hardware point of view. Um, it's much quicker, and um, you can, yeah, it has some advantages. And you don't need to care about mapping anymore um, because the system register is architecturally defined, the address, so it's always the same. It simplifies some things. Um, yeah, again, what I just told. So what does it mean for, for KVM? Um, so there's some gig, v2, the architecture supports um, compatibility for gig v2, but it's optional. So we cannot rely on it. Um, and in fact, there are SOCs which do not implement uh, compatibility. Um, so we have no banked MMIO access anymore, hooray. But it doesn't help us because, of course, we have to support gig v2 in the same code base, so we have to now have the problem that we have to deal with both, so with banked and non-banked MMIO, and they have to kind of not make it, break it. Um, the distributor and redistributor split, so the private and drops are now in a, in a redistributor, the um, system ones in a distributor. Um, the registers there are similar, but not identical, so you need some code refactoring and, and uh, stuff that is kind of okay. 
but it introduces more than one MMIO region. So formerly we had just had the distributor, so it was one base address and uh, the offset just told you the register name. So now we have um, more than one MMIO region. And as we don't use KVMIO bus, or we didn't use, um, that was more a bit challenge to implement then. Um, yeah, also the LPIs, which are the, uh, um, the MSI, the name for the MSIs that we actually have, they, they have some numbers and they can be really large numbers and they can also be sparsely allocated. So bitmaps is no longer a valid data structure to use here. Um, so for the time being, we're holding them in separate data structures that we have there anyway and just have the bits uh, in there. Um, but again, it's separate from what we have currently for the Geekly 2. And also, as I said, the ITS data structures are held in physical memory, which means in our case, if we emulate it in guest physical memory, so from host code we now, from the KVM kernel code, we have to reach into the guest kernel memory. Fortunately, we do not have to do this very often because we are allowed to cache, the architecture allows to cache um, the information that is held in, in memory, and that's what we do, and that's what we utilize much. Um, but we waste precious guest memory because the guest has to allocate those um, pages and give them to the host, basically, but the host doesn't. So currently, we don't yet use them. So just because we have host memory, which is cheaper to access. And from time to time, we have to do a sync with KVM read guest page. Yeah, so um, KVM um, challenges in, in general that we encountered is a VGIG, um, the usual first sentence. Um, KVM was designed for x86, so we came around some limitations. So GSI IRQ routing, which is um, also SCC determined, it's an, it's an APIC x86 term, so it's not a real fit for us. We don't need it because we don't need to map numbers around. Um, but we have to do it for IRQ F FDs, which require it. So we ended up with some identity or simply by offset mapping which is okay, but it's kind of pointless for us to do. Um, the LPI, for the LPI numbers, which would be useful to have there some routing, but um, we do not expose them at this level, so we do not need them. The LPI numbers are never used by anyone except the ITS internally. Um, yeah, also um, ITS MSIs are identified by a triple, not a pair of information. So usually we have a doorbell, which is an address, and you have the payload, which is the data that you write into that address. Um, on the IDS, adds a device ID, because it is, again, a property of this ARM bus that you can see where, from which device the actual write came from, um, which provides really proper isolation. So the device can no longer trigger kind of, kind of spurious interrupts because it, um, the IDS knows which device it comes which ends up that the payload is usually just zero if you have one interrupt per device. And the actual information is the doorbell, which is one per system usually, or one per ITS, which means one per system most of the times. Um, and the device ID is the actual information, which is sampled from the bus. Um, but to go with this, we have to introduce a device ID, a device ID into all the structures KVM has and deals with, K, uh, with MSIs which is something we discussed on the list for a while, how to do it the best way around, and I think we have reached a conclusion now um, how to do this the best. Yeah, and the payload usually on XT6, I think the payload is the global interrupt number. Um, it's not the case, it's just zero most of the time, so um, we cannot use this. Okay, the um, VGIG evolution. So in the beginning, when there was the first um, ARM virtualization support for the VGIG, we had one hardware that was the Geek V2. Um, we could emulate um, one, one gig model to the software, which was the Geek V2. So we had one-to-one, uh, -one, basically, simple. Um, there was a limit of eight CPUs that we easily copied by doing everything in bitmaps. Um, so it's quite okay to have one byte per interrupt, which gives you the CPU number, fine. Um, and also, the, the, um, we had only wired inter interrupts, and the number of them was known from the beginning. It was a fixed value. You could set it up. 
and it was contiguous. So bitmaps is fine and easy to do. Um, if you now think about GeekV3, how did everything changes? So we have multiple hardware devices. So we can have the GeekV2 and the GeekV3 in a guest. Uh, in, in the host, so that um, the code has to, of course, support both. So that now means the world switch code has to take uh, check now. This is the gig v3, then I have to do something different because the register layout is different, or the gig v2. So we ended up now um, with some runtime code patching. So uh, the moment the kernel boots up, it sees the gig v3 and patches out every gig v2 uh, code pass now. Um, yeah. Also, we have not eight CPUs, but two to the power of 32 CPUs, or I think 28, it's actually. Um, but anyway, it's, it's still too much for using any kind of bitmaps and stuff. And uh, we have not only wired IQs, but also MSIs, and they are no longer contiguous, and the number can be very large, so bitmaps are not very good. So it looks like the whole original design um, does not fit very well. So that's kind of um, the stuff that we did on a way actually to get support for gig v3. So the first thing was um, made it easier to for the explicit vgig setup. As I said, you have to set up the addresses and the number of things. And we added an explicit, I'm done with um, setting up this gig, you can use it now, which simplified, because before it was some kind of guessing um, or some kind of automatic, um, okay, you use it, so I assume you have set it up properly um, so which, which had some f funny issues with uh, migration and stuff. Um, so this was, this is done in upstream. Um, we also extended the KVM IO bus to take the vCPU to, uh, to actually pass on the vCPU which the request came from. So we could then move over the um, MMIO handlers um, to the KVM IO bus framework and could use that, which makes it easier to add and uh, other MMIO regions, so not only distributor, but also real distributor and ITS and everything. So it fits more naturally in. Um, that is done upstream. We also support multiple gig hardware models, that's what I said. So we can, um, at the same, with the same kernel, support gig v3 and gig v2 on the hardware. And depending on what's actually on the system when you boot the kernel, um, it does the proper thing. Um, we also support it multiple emulation models. So before it was just a KVM create IQ chip, I think. So one, one IOCTAL without any parameters, which created the IQ chip. But now you have the choice between gigv 2 gigv 3 and everything. Um, so there's this KVM create device, IOCTAL, a new one, um, which was used for, it's used for other architectures as well. And we piggybacked on this and can now properly, so allow user land to set up to request which CPU, uh, which gig model you want to have in a guest. Um, also, all kind of gig with three non-ITS simulation is done in upstream, so that works. In the rare case, you have some gig with three hardware available. So currently, I don't have actually, honestly. Um, I do everything on the model, um, which does it pretty well, I hope, <laughs> and matches hardware. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also to utilize the connection, as I mentioned at the very beginning, between physical and virtual IRQs, so that um, if you EOI um, an IRQ which is linked to a physical um, IRQ, then this gets EOI'd at the same time. Um, this has now reached conclusion on the list, I think, and Mark said he will merge it into next, but the home pages basically. Um, Gig with three ITS simulation, this whole um, table craziness and MSIs, um, there's this patch by me and um, V2 is on a list and under review currently and I think it needs some more discussion and some more love but um, yeah, we, and we ran into some <coughs> funny locking issues. So we, as I said, you do have to do KVM read guest page which you cannot do in a spin lock because it could be not mapped and everything. So it, um, may take an indefinite amount of time and you do not want to root a spin lock at this whole time. So there was some, some locking craziness, which I hopefully solved. Um, yeah, then as I said before, the, the whole architecture um, was to, was designed around MMIO accesses. Um, this may be redesigned, so there are plans to do this, but that means that we have to rewrite most of the VGIG code 
Um, and it's, it's, it's something that is still under this cousin where, where it would be useful to do so. Um, because it means that you throw away the current code, which may not be very well, but um, yeah, it's there and it works. Um, yeah, and we may at the same time like get some some learnings about what what we currently have, and um, improve the, the code layout to be better scalable, for instance. And also, gigv3 is not the end. There's gigv4. The spec is and basically it's the it's the gigv4 spec is the is the same as the gigv3 spec. So the, this uh, this actual PDF covers both versions, and gigv4 allows you to have virtual LPIs, which can be directly injected into a guest. So you can uh, have hardware um, go directly into the guest without the host inter intervention. Um, yeah, but it requires to help you to tell the, the gig basically which, um, which vCPU or which CPU uh, vCPU is currently running on and all these kind of tables and have to be updated and everything. So, and it, also goes into the core KVM IQ subsystem, so that sounds like fun work to do. Okay, yeah, um, that's so far. Am I right? Uh, any questions? Can you use the? The password, the doorbell is used for what exactly? The doorbell is basically the address that the device writes to to trigger an interrupt instead of using an extra wire. Um, it's an, it's an address the device knows and it does the usual bus cycle to write something into it and it will not end into some register but instead trigger an interrupt. So that's, so that's, that's MSI. That's, that's MSI, yeah, that's the ARM implementation of the MSI is basically. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the need to use the GSI routing in order to get IQFD. Yeah. We faced exactly the same problem on power because the data structures used for that routing limited the size of your um, physical interrupt number. Yeah. We had very large physical interrupt numbers. Yeah. Um, so I actually refactored the code so that translation, while it still exists, you can plug in your own functions to do it. Okay. Using your own data structures. Yeah. Just plug in the thing that does physical as virtual. Okay. And there's no table. So that basically solves that problem. Okay, cool. I, I just saw the comments from you guys that you said we have 4096, but we can have more or something. There was some, yeah, yeah I, I just read the comments when I, when I um, added this and I said, okay. <laughs> so we kind of copied the comment basically. So in the first yeah, I to have that in Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I will take a look at it. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. If not, then thank you. Thank you.